Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Friday and happy Earth Day. My name is Eric Eichenberg, and I have the privilege of serving as CEO and president of the Everglades Foundation. We're delighted that you've taken time here this afternoon to, um, to join us as we, uh, we talk about um, our Earth, our climate, space, and our Everglades. And we're delighted uh, with this panel that you're going to hear from uh, this afternoon and the discussion to follow. Um, we have uh, about 60 minutes to, um, to address uh, some key issues that are facing America's Everglades as well as the state of Florida. Uh, but I do wanna just pause to uh, recognize the fact that this is the 52nd uh, Earth Day. April 22nd of 1970 was the first and um, a day that ushered in a number of changes uh, at the federal level as it pertains to um, the environment. We had the ushering in of the Clean Water Act, the Ever uh, Endangered Species Act, uh, the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency, all happening in the early 1970s. But here we are now in 2022, and we have a number of challenges and opportunities to discuss, and we're excited about that. I'm uh, delighted to be joined this afternoon by, by three individuals. I first want to introduce the Chief Science Officer of the Everglades Foundation, Dr. Steve Davis. Steve, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, joining Steve is Dr. Amy Clement. She is a professor at the Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science at the University of Miami. Amy, good to see you as well. Hi, thanks for having me. And finally, we're delighted to be joined by a retired, a real astronaut, a retired NASA astronaut, um, Nicole Stott. I had a privilege of meeting Nicole uh, during the COVID pandemic. We uh, haven't yet met in person, but we've been, uh, we have met um, uh, virtually. I want to let our attendees know that Nicole is not only an astronaut, but she's an aquanaut, she's an artist, she's a mother. Um, and now she's an author with a book that's out, uh, Back to Earth, What Life in Space Taught Me About Our Home Planet and Our Mission to Protect It. Encourage you all to check that out. Um, I'm sure Nicole would appreciate that. Um, Nicole um, served on two missions. Uh, here's a photograph of one of those missions where she was on the International Space Station. On August 28th of 2009, she was uh, on the Space Shuttle Discovery as it uh, took off from Cape Canaveral and docked uh, with the International Space Station. We'll say that she spent 103 days in space as an astronaut on the ISS. Um, she also um, blasted off on the 16th of November, 2009, um, came back on Atlantis, and then she was part of the final mission of the Space Shuttle Discovery on February the 24th of 2011. Nicole, we're delighted that you're here, the 10th woman uh, to perform a spacewalk. And I might add, she was the first person to be participating in a live Twitter connection from space back in 2009. So you are a, um, a trendsetter of uh, 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 certainly a, a American treasure. Nicole, we're delighted that you're here with us today. Yeah, my pleasure to be here and um, happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day. Um, in Florida, one of our best strategies to deal with um, the changes in climate uh, is Everglades restoration. Uh, we've been uh, restoring America's Everglades now for um, 22 years into entering into our third, heading into our third decade. Um, but as we're, as we're doing that, we're also seeing issues uh, relating to flooding and sea level rise, uh, the cleaning of polluted stormwater and increased rainfall, a whole host of issues that we're experiencing right here in our own, in our own state. So Amy, let me, let me begin with you. Um, you're at the Rosenstiel School, you're, you're studying this, you're seeing it, but what can you tell us on the changes that are already occurring and what are those consequences? And more importantly, maybe what steps can be taken to deal with those consequences? Okay, hey, thanks for having me. Um, got the Rosenstiel School picture behind us. We're at the Marine School campus of the University of Miami um, out on Virginia Key. 
Um, I've been working there since 2001, and um, I came. I moved here from New York uh, at a time when um, I think there was a lot of, let's say, uh, skepticism about climate change, and that has all changed. And um, so let's just walk through some like the basics of what we know. So <clears throat> we know that um, we know that the planet is warming and we know that that would not be happening if it weren't for human activities. Um, if it were a natural cycle at all, we'd actually be sort of like starting to cool a little bit. So the, the warming is due to humans. We know that with the warming, um, we have sea level rise just through, due to the thermal expansion of the ocean, warmer ocean, but also due to the input of melting ice from the um, higher latitudes. So we, we know those things are happening. They will continue to happen um, as long as we continue to burn fossil fuels at the rate we do. And we will also experience sea level rise even if we can curb emissions now. So we have the, the reality on the ground here in Florida and in the Everglades is we have to deal with uh, sea level rise. We don't know exactly how fast it will rise, but we know that we know that um, the way that we talk about it in Miami-Dade County is not if two feet of sea level rise will happen, but when. Uh, so that's just, a, I think, a basic reality we have to think about. We also know that these two um, facts that are very well established in the, in the scientific literature that um, are changing our urban environment here in, in South Florida, we have are experiencing increasing um, sea uh, tidal flooding in the king tide seasons. We are experiencing increasing heat, a uh, combination of a warming planet, warming oceans, and urban heat island effect. And we know that those two things are impacting the way we live here in South Florida and Miami in particular. And one other thing we talk about here a lot is hurricanes. Um, there's still some very important scientific uncertainty about how active the coming hurricane seasons will be. Uh, but the two facts that are well established are back to the warming and the sea level rise. We know that as the planet warms, uh, hurricanes produce more rainfall. That's We've seen that happening um, and that will continue as long as warming continues. And we also know that the impacts of storm surge associated with a hurricane will produce more storm surge on top of a higher sea level. So. Those are the facts that we need to contend with in this complex environment where we live um, between the, um, the coastal environment, the urban environment, and then the Everglades. And um, it's a complex problem. Now, Amy, you talk about uh, increased severe weather occurrences, um, rainfall, sea level rise. Um, you know, Steve, as, as we're, as the foundation and others are pushing strongly for restoration of the Everglades and the whole effort to redirect the way water flows on the peninsula. Um, speak to how restoration or moving water, sending water in the direction where it should go, how does that help uh, counter or balance some of the challenges that Amy has just outlined along the coast? Yeah, so th those changes were, you know, that we're seeing in the, the developed areas of, of the Lower East Coast, we're seeing that as well uh, impacting the Everglades. Um, and it's important to know that we're connected to this ecosystem. A lot of people think of it as just Everglades National Park or that undeveloped area out west, or if you're on the west coast to the east, um, th that's our backyard. And it's experiencing these same kinds of impacts. And it's important to know that we've made those problems worse because of the drainage and compartmentalization of the Everglades, cutting it off from its historic uh, headwater supply of Lake Okeechobee, and also polluting our waterways. And, and so there are uh, sort of synergistic impacts that have come out as a result of things like climate change, warmer waters combined with increased pollution. And so you think of our water supply in South Florida, the Biscayne Aquifer recharged by this ecosystem um, because we've depleted uh, the flow of freshwater in the Everglades that has allowed saltwater to intrude further inland, not only 
over land, but also underneath us into that aquifer. So we're seeing the impacts of that. Um, we're seeing habitats transition as a result of that. Mangroves moving further landward. Um, there's emerging research showing that the deprived freshwater flow in some of these coastal wetlands combined with sea level rise and more frequent saltwater inundation is leading to the collapse of those soils, actual land loss uh, around our coastline because of, of these changes and combined with the lack of freshwater flow. Warmer temperatures, uh, Amy described uh, warming impacts in our urban areas. We're experiencing it in the Everglades as well. And it's not just the daytime high temperatures, it's also the nighttime low temperatures aren't as low as they were historically. And that has a, a, a very stressful impact on coastal systems, particularly seagrasses that uh, are dependent upon clear water and light to produce oxygen and warmer water holds less oxygen. So as these waters warm, uh, it's more difficult for these seagrasses to get by uh, during the hottest months and the longest uh, days of, of the year. And so when you also consider what the forecasts are for more rapid storm intensification. We think of Hurricane Irma and the impacts that that had in our coastal areas and, and more uh, frequent drought conditions. It, it really all points to the need for Everglades restoration, sending more of that flow south, storing the water instead of dumping it, knowing that we need to treat it, we need to clean it, we need to stop polluting our waterways. It's all pointing in the same direction in terms of dealing with these impacts. Well, we, we certainly um, we certainly uh, understand those impacts that you've um, that you and Amy both have outlined. Nicole, you know you're you're um, you're unique in the sense that you've had the privilege of seeing Earth um, from space, and you've provided us some really fascinating photographs. And if um, if we could throw the if we could place the the photograph of the Earth um, that you've provided. Um, I want to I want to take you back, if you will, to your um, to your days uh, in space, and certainly um, as a member of the NASA uh, family to this day. Um, what have um, what have Keely the, the the picture of the glow of the, of the Earth itself? Um, um, Nicole, maybe to tell us what you have observed. Uh, what changes have you observed? Um, maybe when you were in space and certainly over these last number of years that you can that you can talk about. Yeah, I well, I think um, one of the things that's really interesting to me, you know, we use these words like global and local. Uh, I think that in this image too, I don't know how you can deny this when you look at this image, which uh, is from that Apollo 16 mission that was going on 50 years ago today, where Charlie and John were, you know, walking around and driving around on the moon doing their, uh, their exploration there. And um, I think that you discover very vividly that global is really local, right? You know, it's so obvious from space that everything is interconnected. You guys have already used that word interconnected and that we share a planetary home together in space. And and I have seen the planet and some changes from space. I think during our missions, which even at a few months duration, you can notice patterns changing. You can, you know, just see the the life of the planet itself kind of moving and um, and changing below you. This very vivid, uh, glowing presentation of the planet. And I think that's one thing to you know just to put out there too. I I don't know about you guys, but I didn't find myself thinking about the fact that we live on a planet very often. <laughs> and I think it's really important for us to do that, to have this consideration of the fact that we are on a planet in space together. And so even having, and these are some images of Florida that were taken between the time frame of, I think like 1985 to 2005. And I know that that you all are probably much better uh, in a much better position to identify the particular differences that we're seeing in these images. But we know that there are, are some there and we are actively involved as earth observers from space as, as the crew on board um, with our artificial satellites, you know, our robotic missions um, looking back at earth. I think we could even you know, speak to the fact that you know, when Charlie and John were on the moon, 
um, a lot of that even through from Apollo 8, uh, where humans first saw Earth from space, from the moon that way, um, was this, you know, this reality of, hey, we're going and we're, you know, Bill Anders said it best, hey, we went all this way to discover, you know, to learn about the moon. And what we really discovered was Earth um, as our home, as a planet. And um, interesting to me, though, like on a personal level, is that I, even having seen some of these changes from space, I think I've become more aware now of the changes that, um, that I'm seeing in my own backyard. <laughs> And more, I think, attuned to them, more open to really acknowledging them. And um, that's, that's become more real to me, the interconnectivity of it all. You know, uh, we've all had conversations before about things like red tide. And, um, you know, I, I look at it, I've moved back to Florida from Houston. And in the past five years, I thought, I think I've seen in the, the canal, the intercoastal canal behind my backyard, more intense and more frequent red tide than I ever remember in you know my time before living in Florida. And you know it's I find myself considering the broader impact to the life that that water supports and the surrounding ecosystem and to life on our you know on a planetary ecosystem scale. And um, I know I'm kind of rambling about this, but I think that, what's happening with the Everglades and what the Everglades Foundation has put into motion. You know, um, Amy, what you're doing, raising this awareness with, with students that um, in their lives will, I think, be driven to take the action that's necessary. Um, it, it, makes me, it makes me have hope because I really do believe that you know, that we have the power to create a future for all life on earth that's as beautiful as it looks. I mean, this is a beautiful image <laughs> of Florida from space. I think there's no denying that Florida is a really special place that's um, part of a planet that's our home. And even in that beauty though, I think we could, we could look at the picture and find the places where we need to be applying the solutions that we know we already have. And I love that coming together like this, I think we're encouraging that we're going beyond just raising awareness, but there's real action taking place as well. I wanna keep this, um, this beautiful photograph on the screen here because um, Amy, I wanna come back to you. You know, we, we, Nicole just, um, just focused on her experiences from outer space and understanding all of this interconnection and, um, and the issues, but on the, on the local level, you're, you're the vice chair of the city of Miami's resiliency uh, committee, the the effort here locally, and what this photograph demonstrates, or you know, the population is all along the coast. Our major metropolitan areas are along the coast. Um, so maybe speak to um, we have we have the challenges that we are observing and that are are verified, but then how are local governments, and maybe in particular, what is the city of Miami? Since you're a leader on that panel. Uh, what are local governments doing to address these concerns? Thanks. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I just want to echo some of Nicole's comments about like the the sort of beauty and wonder aspect of the, you know, of of these problems. So on the one hand, a lot of what we're doing at the university is you know exploring these interconnections, how is, for example, melting in Antarctica and what's happening there connected to what we're happening here, so even beyond Florida. So um, so a lot of what I do in my day to day is, is educating and doing research on these basic science questions about the climate system, how does it work, how do we get here, where are we going. But then um, I've gotten involved in the last five or so years with local climate adaptation, knowing, as I mentioned, that we, we, we have these changes that are coming and we need to do something about it. And the changes are unprecedented. There's no rule book for how to, how to manage an environment, a unique environment like we have, a city, densely populated, rapidly developing, sitting on porous limestone with an ocean on one side and a unique ecosystem undergoing change on the other side in the Everglades. So what's what do we do? And I, I think the, you know, the local governments are all ready. 
um, to with their resilience offices, they're ready to move forward with these problems. One of the areas where as a scientist and researcher, I think we have um, a really you know, important role and opportunity is to bring the expertise that we have to bear. So at the University of Miami, at Florida International University and the other universities in the region to, um, to help answer these questions about what are we doing? Or what should we do about this? And because there's no rule book for it, how do we know if what we're doing is working and, and how do we adjust if it's not? And so um, Nicole mentioned making up, you know, visual observations of algae and channel and, you know, and canals around us. Um, and it's, there's a really important role for the scientists in the community to be monitoring what's going on, establishing baselines. And, and the reality is that, is that there's a lot of data gaps. So you mentioned, you asked what we're doing in the city and the county. Um, and there's a lot going on in terms of um, planning, but a big part of what we do, and um, in, I have established a, a, uh, a research collaborative called the Resilient, Resilient 305 Collaborative with Tiffany Troxler, who's at FIU, um, in, in what are we doing in order to support those actions that are being taken locally and understanding how they're impacting our environment and the community. and um, and then being able to adjust um, as things as things evolve. So I'll give you a few examples of um, what's happening locally. So this, the, the the county, the Miami Dade County, um, has a, has a, a resilience office. It has a staff of an amazing collection of people who, with lots of different expertise. They've just added a chief key officer, Jane Gilbert, the first of its kind in the world. Um, and so trying to come up with actions to, and, and really it's in development. So trying, what are the right actions to address the problem of heat and how it's impacting people? Um, you know, is there, are there green infrastructure solutions? Are there, are there policy solutions? So those are all being developed. And then the reality is from our, all of our municipalities who deal with tidal flooding that we're raising roads, we're pumping seawater out of the streets. We're, we're trying to catch up. Um, so on the one hand, trying to catch up with the changes that we're already experiencing now, but also planning um, for the, the long-term um, really unprecedented changes that are, are coming our way. And it, it's always a, you know, I think as a people in the audience are probably like, well, planning, you know, like let's do something. And that's where, I, you know, I think in my role as a scientist and the people that I work with is that, um, yes, we need to do something and we are, um, you know, dealing with, you know, we are trying to manage urban flooding and we are trying to, um, and, and we are trying to, um, to reduce the impacts of, of heat on people, but we also need to know if what we're doing is working and um, we need to be able to adjust. So um, that's sort of a, a broad answer to your, your question. And I'm happy to, uh, you know, give more specific examples, but I would say, you know, broadly speaking, there's like actions that were happening right now, urban flooding and heat, and then long-term planning that is really, um, it's really challenging. You know, Steve, as Amy's talking about urban flooding and the need to pump water out of the streets and raise roads, um, on the other side of that coin, within the Everglades, we're raising roads, building bridges, um, pulling the plug in the tub, if you will, to get water flowing um, south, reservoirs, infrastructure projects being uh, not just um, planned, but now being built um, to redirect freshwater flow uh, on the peninsula. And, and again, back to um, Nicole's beautiful photograph of the Florida Peninsula. I mean, from Lake Okeechobee there in the center, we have got our coastal communities, we have the Everglades in the center. But uh, hearing what, uh, what Amy was saying on the urban urbanization, the continued urbanization of Florida, um, the science that's needed to collaborate or to coincide, if you will, with Everglades restoration, how can we ensure that the core of Everglades restoration can support the challenges that Amy's outlining so that they're all in, in concert together? Yeah. Uh 
we've known that Everglades restoration is essential to our modern day economy. That's an economy in Florida that's based on tourism. Uh, much of that tourism is water-based. Uh, our communities are just like our ecosystems and that they're all connected by water in South Florida. So uh, at present, we're, we're dumping much of the water that we get mo moving into Lake Okeechobee. Uh, we're blessed with upwards of four to five feet of rainfall each year. Uh, much of that comes within our wet season. And uh, at present, we don't have the capacity to store that water, cleanse enough of it to send it south. That's what Everglades restoration does. And we know that that's what our communities will benefit most from in terms of water supply. Uh, but we're also learning. Uh, the, the science is, is continuing. We have a lot of information, much of it real time, but we're still connecting dots. And one of the most recent dots we've connected is the impact of Lake Okeechobee discharge on exacerbation of red tide on the, on the West Coast. We, it was intuitive. It made sense. But we finally have the, the scientific validation of that. And so that uh, uh, body of knowledge will continue to shape our thinking about the importance of Everglades restoration, because we know what the impact of red tide is on the West Coast, and even periodically when it wraps around and makes its way to the East Coast. We also know that uh, cyanobacteria, blue-green algae, is a climate change winner. Um, it's one of those things that benefits from warmer waters, allowing it to outcompete other types of algae, uh, especially in high nutrient conditions. Um, and, and we know that lake discharge to the east and west coast uh, can expand the impact of toxic blue-green algae, which also affects our communities and potentially human health. So again, Everglades restoration that allows us to redirect that water to the south and not in a polluted state, but storing it treating it through uh, large treatment wetlands, allowing that water to go back to the Everglades, hydrates that ecosystem to do all the things that we benefit from, uh, recharge of our aquifer, um, hydrating those wetlands longer, allow them to sequester atmospheric carbon. So there's, there's a, a, a benefit in terms of mitigating climate change by restoring this ecosystem, as well as all the habitat benefits and uh, sending clean water south, get us going all the way to Florida Bay. Uh, this is a massive uh, biological system that has the capacity to sequester enormous amounts of carbon. Uh, it just takes water and we've got to restore this ecosystem to get the water to where it needs to go under those bridges that you referenced all the way down into Everglades National Park and ultimately to Florida Bay. Nicole, you've um, you've heard Amy talk about the local efforts that um, cities like Miami and the Miami-Dade County are undertaking. Others around Florida are doing the same. Steve just highlighted um, some of the state and federal actions that the Army Corps and the Water Management District are doing with infrastructure. But your experience with NASA, in particular, maybe speak to us on what that agency is doing to communicate the challenges that are affecting our planet, our Earth. Um, and, and, and what is the agency doing to, uh, to help address them? Yeah, and I'm, I'm very thankful for the, the information that um, Steve and Amy have passed on here, because I, I found myself thinking, you know, like the three R's, the reduce, reuse, recycle. <laughs> I, kept, I kept thinking about that. Why, why isn't that what we're doing when it comes to like urban development? Um, why does it always have to be an expansion and not just a you know, reduction, first of all, or reusing what we have, recycling, whether it's a building or an existing development. And I know that's not in response to your question, but I just had to throw that, that that's, I'm always thinking about that. Why does it always have to be new and expansive? But um, from the NASA standpoint, you know, I think it's really cool that in one way or another, I think NASA has been involved um, in certainly raising awareness and supporting solutions to climate change and other planetary challenges from the very beginning. And um, Erica, as you mentioned at the very beginning with you know, Earth Day and this association with um, the formation, this whole timing kind of association with the formation of the EPA and the establishment of Clean Air and Clean Water Acts that all fell, I think, 
even if it's indirectly as a result of us witnessing ourselves as a planet in space, that 1969, you know, or 68, I guess, iconic image of, you know, of Earth rising above this other planetary body, you know, the moon, you know, witnessed with humans' eyes for the first time and shared um, with us. I think that that impact has been really huge, this perspective of who and where we all are in space together. Now, I guess um, I look at in more recent times, you know, NASA's role in, you know, communicating this, but also providing data that supports the, um, you know, the, the solu implementation of solutions, understanding where we were, where we are, where we predict, you know, that we're going on a particular trajectory with certain you know, certain criteria in place um, and understanding that, I think about what we've done with the International Space Station program. And as this mechanical life support system that we've built in space as an international community, right? Um, we've built it in space to mimic as best we can what Earth does for us naturally, right? We, we know, Every day as a crew on board that space station, there's a really, I, I mean, I love this image. I, I think it's like this masterpiece hanging in space. And um, on, on board that facility, we know as a crew that every day we have to be acutely aware of how much CO2 is in our atmosphere, of how much clean drinking water we have, of the integrity of our thin metal hull, and absolutely aware of the health and well-being of all of our crewmates. And so for me, there's no better example, you know, through this NASA and international cooperation with other space agencies around the world of how we should be behaving like crewmates down here on Spaceship Earth. And I know that seems like kind of this high level, maybe kumbaya kind of um, way of thinking of NASA's participation in all of this. But I, I really believe it's like these, these simple lessons that it's put you know, the reality of how we can peacefully and successfully overcome really complex challenges, like getting out of gravity to, you know, just out of this hold that gravity has on us of living and working in space, even for a short period of time with that deadly vacuum of it surround, surrounding us. And then, you know, coming safely home, those, we have it in us to overcome those challenges. And I think through the NASA programs like the space station where the humans are you know, intimately involved, we see this need to accept our role as crewmates. And that's what I think all of, you know, all of what's happening at the Everglades Foundation, Amy, what you're doing at the university and with your partnerships, these are people coming together as crew <clears throat> you know, on, on this spaceship, you know, um, spaceship Earth. And it's a much different reality than living like a passenger. And because if we live like passengers on board the space station, you know, we wouldn't survive and we certainly wouldn't thrive there. And I think the same is true here. Now, I think there's been this urgency since the beginning, right? I mean, for as long as I've been alive, you know, maybe climate change weren't the words that were being used, but, um, you know, it's been there. And, um, and perhaps for as long as we've been able to witness and measure the impact that we as humans are having on our planetary life support system, even locally, even before we understood global, that this was going on. And where I hold hope is that we know the solutions exist to this, right? Um, so behaving like crew is this key to us really making those, the, the reality of those come to life. Um, the, you saw the motto of the International Space Station program um, on that picture, which is off the earth for the earth. Everything that's being done there in one way or another is ultimately about improving life on earth. And that includes observation and measurement of the vital signs of our planet, providing that information to you and others who need it to understand and solve the problems. And I think that's gonna con continue with crew members doing that, with satellites as earth observers, and, um, and it's just gonna become more and more uh, available um, to allow us to, to really take the action that's necessary. And I think when you see something like this, you know, kind of in contrast to that beautiful image of earth as a planet in space, you know, you can't, again, you can't deny it. This like, it, it helps us make a connection, establish a relationship to what is happening on earth. And it certainly helps us look at earth as this living, being itself as well that we, you know, that we are a part of. And 
Um, this one I love because it really, and it says it right at the top, you know, watching the earth breathe from space. Holy moly, you know, uh, the inhaling and exhaling of the planet. And that's pretty cool to see. And all that red and blue tells us where um, the good and the bad stuff is. And we can use that information to, to solve the problems we have. Well, I must say, um, we love having you part of this panel because you've brought <laughs> some great pictures and graphics. Um, <laughs> I was, I was gonna, I, 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 you know, it's ramble fest for me because I love this topic. <laughs> I, I was going to mention to our, um, to those that are uh, watching and attending here to, uh, if they had questions, to do put them in the chat. We did take, we do have one. Carol, we appreciate your, your question. I'm going to throw this to Amy. Um, the question uh, that I think folks can see, how do you anticipate the huge amount of people who are, who are here and will move to Florida and how will that affect freshwater availability? I think this is a question for Steve, but I will just mention for, you know, general context that, you know, the, that we, we get our fresh water from the Biscayne Aquifer and um, which is, is embedded in a porous limestone, which is the bedrock that, that Miami is on. And as sea level rises, we face in a day or a, infiltration of seawater into the into the fresh water that we have. There's a lot of competing demands on that fresh water. And um, you know, Steve is a better, much better person to talk about this than I am. But the climate change part of it, which is the sea level rise, is um, is a factor that is like the pressures that that the that Carol mentions of increasing population. Is, is another threat to our freshwater. But I'll, I'll turn it to Steve because he's definitely the expert. Well, before you do, I'll just say that um, we're at what, 22 million people now and 42% of the population in this state lives within the Everglades uh, where they get their water from the Everglades here in South Florida. So that's a large population. I believe we're, we've crossed over hundred million tourists again, coming to Florida, which is another, um, uh, they utilize the resource. So Steve, as, as the population continues to grow and folks are moving to Florida, we're back in droves here. Um, the ability to keep a fresh water supply available. And as Amy mentioned, you have uh, users of water, whether it's the urban area, whether it's the utilities, the environment, uh, agriculture. Um, how do we ensure that, um, that we're having that fresh water available to a growing population and avoiding impacts of sea level rise, or excuse me, saltwater intrusion, because once that hits a fresh water source, it's over. So how are we ensuring that we can protect that, that fresh water availability? Well, it, it, it takes an understanding of, of our water supply and, and where we get it. it Amy described the, the Biscayne Aquifer. It's this large bubble of fresh water beneath us. Uh, and it's replenished annually in our wet season rains. We get plenty of rain uh, to drive this ecosystem and provide us with our water supply. There's no shortage of water, but the problem is we shortchange ourselves by dumping much of it to the east and west coast. And and I, as as Nicole was talking, it just makes me think: what what if we were in the space station and we just decided to dump half our fresh water? just dump it out into space. I mean, that's insanity. Uh, it, it, it doesn't make sense if you put yourself in that space station, that, that concept that we depend on this. We depend on the Everglades. We depend on it for our water supply. Um, and we think of communities out in the arid Southwest. What would they do to have that fresh water that we pollute and dump to tide, not to even mention the impacts that it has on those communities with blue-green algae and now with our understanding of the impacts on red tide. Uh, we know the solution. We know the solution. It's, it's store that water, clean it, send it south. Uh, that's Everglades restoration, but it's much bigger than that. And we need to recognize that we're all uh, all, all 9 million of us in South Florida are in that space station, and this is our water supply, this is our habitat, this is our ecosystem, and we depend on it. Why not invest in it?
Well said, Steve. Um, Amy, we, we do have a question from uh, Laura. Uh, she's asking if the, um, the committee which you serve on, uh, again, Amy is the vice chair of the city of Miami's climate resiliency efforts. Um, do you work with other states? Uh, maybe, let me, let me uh, take the liberty of revising Laura's question a little bit. Maybe other counties um, adjoining or nearby counties. And um, she's asking also even other countries in the work of um, that you're tackling. Yeah, th that's a great question. Um, we're, and obviously in South Florida, not alone in facing sea level rise and heat and hurricanes. Um, and there are a, a several different um, uh, networks of cities and um, and counties. So couple, I'll mention a couple. So one is the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Compact, where the four counties of South Florida have come together in order to come up with some uh, <clears throat> say guidelines for planning. So one of the things they do is they produce regional sea level rise projections, which are uncertain um, and constantly being revised based on the latest science. Yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, the latest came out in 2019. Um, and there are these different projections and each of these each of these different scenarios, let's call it the um, extreme high, intermediate high and median, you can sort of think of them as different possible futures, all within the realm of possibility. Um, and what so that planning for infrastructure that are obviously where these counties have to coordinate and be on the same page, that they, they use the same kind of, they, they use these same curves for planning across the entire Southeast Florida uh, region. So that's one area where we coordinate. Um, you know, it's a very specific example. There are a number of different other or, um, networks. So one is called C40 Cities. Um, I can put it in the chat once I stop talking. Um, is a collection of cities around the world who have um, are trying to learn from each other. So um, if we, let's say, want to do some interventions to mitigate extreme and growing heat in the in our city, what can we learn from other cities that have have similar climate threats or, or similar um, challenges that we have um, and how can they learn from us? So we really, we do in South Florida think that um, there are a number of things where we are really, um, I would say on the leading edge of, of innovating and thinking about how to deal with these problems. And one area where is, is um, I think you'll really appreciate this from an Everglades Foundation perspective is that we have a number of nonprofit organizations, local governments, universities that really are well coordinated with each other, that we understand that what you're doing in the Everglades impacts Biscayne Bay um, and that we need to coordinate and that's happening. A really good example is the recent fish kill that happened in um, in North and North Biscayne Bay, where um, scientists, nonprofits, um, and the local government all got together and said, "What's happening? We got to figure this out. We need to and we need to come up with a solution so it doesn't keep happening." And um, so I do think that that we are really well coordinated within Miami. We are tapped into other counties and other cities around the world, and in some cases. They're learning from what we're doing and, by, and vice versa as well. Nicole, you just heard Amy talk about how um, the city of Miami is um, coordinating with other cities and other governments, other entities around the country, around the world. Um, maybe just speak to your experience and, and I'll, I'll try to tie this together, but uh, on the International Space Station, you're there with other um, astronauts from other countries and you all are there uh, to carry out uh, different objectives and missions. And you all have to collaborate, I assume, and maybe you can maybe speak to that, but what, what advice would you give to folks like Amy that have the task of coordinating at a local level, branching out to work with other governments, um, other entities? How can um, maybe your experience on the station help those that have to tackle these issues within a 
uh, political um, system that we operate in? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. I think, um, again, I think what we've done as this kind of cooperative platform on board the, the International Space Station, it's just such a wonderful example. I mean, if you think back, so over 20 years now, we've had these, um, the, the five uh, international space agencies, so the US with NASA, um, Japan, Canada, Europe, that has like 11 of those countries, and then um, Russia all partnering on this, this platform. And, um, and somehow, you know, we've done that peacefully, successfully in this time. When you look at the people in this picture, and you do see the different flags. Uh, the only one rep not represented in this picture is Japan, though as a crew, we are representing the, the Japanese space agency as well um, with the work we're doing on board. But it's not like, you know, those of us with the, the American flag can only go into the US modules and the Russians are only down in the Russian module. I mean, it, like they were all separate. We are one crew on one space station with one commander at any given time. And then with the tens of thousands of people across the, the agencies supporting us from, you know, from here on earth to make this all possible. I think it goes back to the beginning of it really in, and it sounds like, you know, Amy, like you guys are already working this way. You are, you're not closing yourselves off to the involvement from other universities or other counties around the state of Florida or even, perhaps extending at some point to, you know, kind of statewide, state to state kind of things, and maybe even to, you know, other countries um, participating in, in what you're doing with the, the work that's going on as part of the committee that you have. Um, I think that's what makes the space station so great and the partnership so great is that we all came in with this overarching mission, and you can use off the earth for the earth as that mission um, for the space station, you know, that's at one level. But ultimately it was about how are we gonna work in space together on this laboratory, share the, the work that we're doing, do that as one crew and um, provide benefit back to earth as a result of it um, for the challenges that we all have there, as well as how do we explore further off our planet. And I, I know it seems really simple, but I think it's happening in the, the way Amy describes this is that you're all going in with a common mission and figuring out how you utilize the strengths that each of you have in a way to address the problems that you're, you know, you're working on and acknowledging, this is even harder because we do this as crewmates too, individual crewmates, acknowledging that you might have weaknesses too, right? big deal to, to say, okay, we might not be doing this so well in this one part of the state. And those folks over there, they might be really awesome at it, already have it. How do you pull that stuff together? And we do that at every level within the space station program. We are doing that crew member to crew member. We are doing that across the board with our, our five different agencies. And we do it with respect to all of the mission um, priorities that we have. And so I don't know if that really answered the question, but I think that it's it's a proactive decision to it, up front to say, here's what our mission is. And then it's working, even though everybody will not agree all the time, that does not always happen, but having the rules of engagement in place to deal with those differences as they come up and then ultimately coming up with the best solution. Well, certainly an interesting perspective that probably could be emulated as the work continues um, on these issues. Uh, we have a few, just a few minutes left together, and I want to, I want to um, get each of you um, a perspective as we move forward. Um, we have uh, Everglades restoration uh, when it was signed into law in 2000. It laid out a 30-year plan to restore America's Everglades. So we are in a decade where we see big projects that are being um, built and the effort to, as Steve has described, redirect the flow of water on the Florida Peninsula. So I want us to look forward to the 60th anniversary of Earth Day. Maybe we can all gather back together as a panel, but in the year 2030, we'll celebrate 60 years of Earth Day and 30 years of Everglades restoration. Um, Nicole has mentioned the word hope a couple of times here in her remarks. I know the foundation I think I can speak for Amy in the sense that there's a great sense of optimism, um, along with a sense of urgency. So what to each of you, maybe for 60 seconds each, um, 
where does that hope or that optimism um, come from to you individually? And what do we need to be doing as a collective community to achieve goals uh, in a short term um, to see benefits for our earth and our planet with an understanding about the year 2030? Uh, we hope to have great progress. So let me, let me Nicole, why don't you uh, kick that off for us as we close? Sure, happy to. It's like my the my least favorite question. Where do you see yourself in five years? That one, um, but I think that, I think that for me the the hope does underlie it all, right? Um, I've been fortunate enough to participate in conversations like this one today with people that I know are actively actively working to implement the solutions that we need, you know, to these problems. I've seen it happen in space in a way that almost you know, seems unimaginable. I'm hoping that we continue to utilize the space environment as a way to lift some of the industrial issues we have off of this planet, to utilize that benign environment of space to provide us with you know, solutions to these, um, these problems that we have here on Earth. I am very hopeful that we will continue to broaden this um, approach as crewmates and not passengers um, here on this planetary spaceship. Uh, again, through conversations like this, I see more and more of that happening. I see our young people in schools wanting to know how what they're going to study is going to help um, make life better for everyone that we share this planet with. And um, my, I'm hoping that in 2030, we'll be looking back and Steve will, and you guys will have completely redirected that water and, um, and Florida will not be dumping, <laughs> you know, we won't have to be dumping that clean water anymore. And that will be in a stage of, of revitalization that's encouraging to everyone else around the planet as well. Thank you, Nicole. Um, Steve? Well, I your question makes me think that, you know, 10, 20 years ago, we didn't have much optimism about Everglades restoration. Uh, you know, when the plan was passed in 2000, this state federal partnership, uh, it took us a while to get going. And, and it's only been within the last 10 years that we've seen uh, robust funding, we've seen projects being planned, we've seen projects being constructed and even completed. So we've reached sort of our momentum. We need to continue that moving forward to complete restoration within the next decade or so. Uh, and and I'm, I'm much more optimistic now that we can do that. Um, thinking about the, the global issue, I, I, it's almost analogous. Um, we're, we're still building up our speed and we're seeing much more in the way of, of communication, effective communication that's resulting from the great science. Science is at the heart of all this, right? Uh, whether it's Everglades restoration or solving this climate change crisis. Uh, we need the science, we need communication, we need these networks, whether at the local community level, at the state level, at the international level, we need networks of people that are committed to solving this problem. And innovation is obviously a big part of that as well. Um, we need to take steps uh, personally, uh, at, at the national level to, to, to do our part. But in some sense, we're going to be relying on innovation uh, moving forward. And obviously, science is at the heart of that as well. So um, I, I think just staying the course, we're, we're seeing uh, effective communication on the topic. More and more people are being exposed to this. More and more people are accepting that it's, that it's a problem we need to do something about. So um, I am optimistic and having a, a daughter who's concerned about this and thinking about it, uh, I, I know that that generation is going to do their part uh, when we hand the baton over to them. Amy, you're in the classroom uh, and, and educating that next generation. Um, your closing comments, please. Well, I, I love both of the comments by Nicole and Steve. I um, I think that, uh, and, and the optimism, I love to hear that, Steve, that you've been, that you've turned from being skeptical to optimistic about the Everglades restoration. That's really exciting. And um, Nicole, I love the comments about the crew. And um, one of the things that um, I think as an as a important takeaway that is something everyone can do is that 
research on communication shows that um, it's, it can be very difficult to motivate people to take actions. But the one thing we know that works is, is when you hear about issues from people in your circle. Um, that actually works to motivate people. Um, the example is with, with hurricane predictions. So, um, you know, you're getting all this information about a hurricane, but when do you decide to do something about it? When you talk to your neighbors and you see that they're doing something about it. And so one thing everyone here can take away is, um, is, is talking to your family, friends, your, your networks about these issues. And I see a lot in the chat about, um, about fossil fuel emissions and, um, as much as we have, you know, are faced with the problem of adapting to climate change, we have to do something about reducing fossil fuel emissions because the kind of changes that will happen if we don't are, are beyond what we can imagine um, and, and for the Everglades, for South Florida. Um, and so we really have to turn that around. So talking to people about climate change being driven by fossil fuels um, and that we need to encourage, we need to elect leaders that are ready to move on this. And we need to, um, we need to encourage those in leadership to, to develop policies that will support a transition to non-fossil fuel based energy supplies. Um, and you know it will be a transition, so it's you know not going to happen tomorrow. But if we don't start today, then uh, we're just kicking the can down the road. So I really see an important role for for everyone in um, in this you know kind of collective action of. Uh, and I will just reflect back, Eric. You asked about students, um, the next generation. Steve mentioned his daughter. That um, people are very motivated. I think they're re they're ready to um, change the way they live. And they, they really want to be able to, um, to, uh, to turn things around with climate. So it's not a tough sell for the, for the, for the younger people, but we need to, um, you know, we need to get everybody on board with, um, with uh, changing the way that we, we use and with changing the way we produce energy and changing the, our interaction, our understanding of the environment and the consequences of, of all of these of human activities on our environment. And with that, um, that concludes our Earth Day discussion. I wanna thank uh, Dr. Amy Clement, uh, Dr. Steve Davis and Nicole Stott for um, joining us here on this 52nd anniversary of Earth Day. Uh, a wonderful discussion, not only about um, the challenges that we face, but also the opportunities that lie ahead um, and the importance of restoring America's Everglades. Those that you're still with us, if you have any um, questions or would like additional information, do go to evergladesfoundation.org. Um, you can um, see uh, materials there. Also, you can sign up to receive updates from us on the progress of, um, of the mission and um, we wish you all a wonderful afternoon and happy Earth Day.